John 18, 28 through 32 reads, and then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered him, if this man were not doing evil, we wouldn't have brought him to you. But Pilate looked at them and said, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews then said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. Here's the scene. Jesus is brought before Caiaphas. Pilate. Massive political divide. I know we couldn't imagine that here. <laughs> but if you could get yourself to picture it. Socioeconomic divide. Religious divide. The country, previously captured by the Roman Empire, is now completely split on this figure that is a disruptor that comes in and changes culture, engages society, moves people in directions that they never could think imaginable. The scene is tense. In the middle of the night. Why? So that they would not have to be seen in the court of a Gentile. Because the religious people if seen by them, could not take participation in their practices. Fear flowing through those who are against Jesus. Fear flowing through those that are for Jesus. On each side, wondering what this day's conclusion would bring. This is the temperature that we walk into in Jesus' story this morning. Let's ask his help to bring something forward from it. Jesus, we thank you. We love you. We worship you. We embrace your presence. Holy Spirit, thank you for being here. Man, we, we ask for your help. Lord, we ask for your help uniquely today. Today, we, we recognize that we need your help in parsing this passage of scripture so that it can be applicable to the lives of your saints. Lord, I pray that you give the boldness that you need me to deliver your message and your word with. Anoint the heads, hearts, ears, minds of those who are to receive it. Lord, anoint my lips, allow my words to be eliminated and yours to be heard only in Lord. Also, we'd be remiss in this time not to lift up our country to you. In time of our own divide, turmoil, stress, fear, we lift up those who you have placed in leadership over us. Lord, allow us to so focus on the kingdom in which you've called that we engage culture past a singularity of leadership and we move culture truly to an embrace of your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So the scene was read. You see Jesus is brought to Pilate early in the morning by the Jewish leaders, demonstrating their urgency and unwillingness to defile themselves by entering a Gentile home, despite their intent to put an innocent man to death. This is fascinating here. I've kind of labeled this subsection, if you will, the irony of power. 
One of my favorite theologians, as he writes on John, he writes this, that Jews' rejection of Jesus as their Messiah climaxes here in their complicity with the Roman Empire. What does that mean? It means, think about this. I want you to get to this point in your imagination and your thought process, that the Jewish people who were captured by the Roman Empire and enslaved by the Roman Empire are now, watch this, going to the Roman Empire to deliver one of their own who can actually set them free. This is amazing. The irony of power here, and I don't think before we judge the Jews of 2,000 years past that we might not be past this in our own culture. Family, look at this with me. Now, the, the phrase that I use is the Jews' rejection of Jesus as their Messiah climaxes here in the complicity with the Roman, Empire, or Roman authority. They reject their king to preserve ritual religious purity. A tragic irony underscores the blindness of religious legalism and highlights the depravity of our hearts. Why? Because although we do not reject Jesus in fear of religious scrutiny, I don't believe many of us are there. I believe sometimes we can reject Jesus in our own way and receive the very thing that we are in bondage to. You see, the Jews here in this point of the story are in bondage to religiosity. They are in bondage to tradition. They are in bondage to society. They are in bondage to the way things have been. And with fear of that bondage, they run deeply more into it and deliver and walk themselves deeper into the hand of bondage rather than receiving the hand who can actually break their chains and set them free. Man, have you been like the Jews this morning, like I have? Have you sometimes gone more deeply in to the thing that has placed you in bondage rather than running to the one who can release you? This is what the Jews find themselves in just a day before the death of Jesus. Look at this. D.A. Carson puts it this way. The irony is that they worried about ritual cleanness while committing the greatest injustice. You know, we, we may not be delivering Jesus to the cross. But man, some of us have done this even as early as this morning. What do you mean by that, Pastor? Man, this is, this is what I mean. I hear this phrase and it just cuts me to the core. The end justifies the mean. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Sin is sin. And the Jewish people thought, well, if, if I deliver Jesus up, then we can go and worship the way that we've always worshiped before. So the end justifies the mean. No, you were, you were committing a crime against an innocent man. Let's lighten it up a little bit. Some of us have done this this morning, even this. Why? Why do I say that? Because we've yelled at our spouse or our children so that we could be on time to church. <laughs> the end justifies the mean. Pastor, I was trying to receive the message. <laughs> Yo, get in the car. We're going to church. <laughs> it's like, whoa, okay, I'm trying to be like spirit filled. <laughs> you know, like, <clears throat> I'm sure your kids are so excited about learning about Jesus <laughs> now. Yes but you got here on time. <laughs> Some of us have done this this morning when your wife is sitting there in the car next to you, babe, we got to stop at Starbucks on the way. We got to stop, but it's going to make us late. And now you two don't talk to each other the whole entire ride to church <laughs> while she's sipping a caramel macchiato, enjoying herself. <laughs> Man, in so much of a heavier way, we have committed the same crimes, the same sins as the Jewish people in our own hearts, haven't we? Have we, not, have we not sat there and chosen something to a good result that is still sin? Pastor, I, I only lied so that I could get that promotion so that I could provide for my family better. I only misinformed this person so that they would come to this good event. 
I only did this thing so that I could do that thing. The irony is that they worried about ritual cleanness while committing the greatest injustice. What else do we learn about this passage? This passage continues. We're gonna go all the way to verse 40 today, and it shows us the nature of Jesus' kingdom. Look at how the story continues to unfold. It says, so Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? And then Jesus answers in the most Jesus way that we've seen him answering all throughout the book of John, which is fascinating. Jesus encounters these people who he realized needs him, needs spiritual healing, needs other things rather than what they're asking for. Think about it this way. Nicodemus, he asked for some mental ascension to realize what do I have to do to be born again? The woman at the well, she needed a physical ascension. She thought she needed something physical and Jesus then turns her mind, moves her to the spiritual. We think about this all throughout scripture. The woman caught in adultery. She thinks she needs some type of emotional healing and he turns her to a spiritual healing. And again, even in the latter days, the final moments of Jesus's humanity on earth, he with compassion looks at Pilate and he goes, Hey, who, who told you that? Did you come to that realization on your own? You know how he kind of rephrases this? Hey, are you worried about me taking over your kingdom? Like truly worried about that? You know, it's fascinating. Historical scholars show that Pilate kept a journal. And in his journal, Pilate writes, because he has to keep record of different things happening amongst um, his piece of the kingdom. And he writes about Jesus in his historical journal. And he actually says, Jesus is no threat Politically, he sits there, leans against trees, and teaches people with no weapons. That's like in his journal. It's a rephrase, but that's like in his journal. It's fascinating, isn't it? That, that, that Pilate, Jesus, knowing Pilate from the beginning of time, looks into his heart and basically says, hey, you, you know I've read what you wrote, right? I know you're not actually worried about me. Let me settle that worry. He asks questions to get to a desired conclusion and Pilate answers him pretty much out of frustration now because it's two or 3 a.m. I'd be upset too. Am I a Jew? He says, your own nation, the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? He's like, look, man, you know clearly that it doesn't actually bother me, but all of your people are delivering you to me so tell me just what's going on. And Jesus answers him, and he then satisfies, he satisfies this desire of Pilate, this worry, this concern. Look at what he says. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. He immediately sets Pilate at ease. I'm not here to take over this, man. I don't want what you have. If my kingdom were, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. He says, you, you realize I walked here, right? <clears throat> like on the way over, one of my servants tried to fight. I told him to put away his sword and I healed the dude's ear. I put the dude's ear back on. Like I'm here, like I'm just standing here. If, if I really wanted this, wouldn't I be fighting? He's like, use logic here. And then he says, but my kingdom is not from this world. Pilate said to him, it's amazing how Pilate just gets one phrase. So you're a king. It's like, we both know that's not the point I was making. And Jesus answered, fine. You say I'm a king. For this purpose I was born and for this purpose I have come into the world. He says, you really want to know the purpose of why I'm here? You can say I'm a king. That's fine. Whatever. Use whatever vernacular you want. Here's my purpose to bear witness to the truth. Not a clearer moment of Jesus's purpose on earth, his divine fulfillment on earth than his declaration exactly of what he is doing here to Pilate. And then he says, everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate's question, are you king of the Jews, reflects his limited view of kingship as political power. 
Jesus' response points to a kingdom that is not of this world. <coughs> Sorry, I promise I'm not sick. It's allergies. Killing me. Jesus' kingdom, what he is saying here, transcends earthly political structures. It draws from prophetic images of a spiritual reign that disrupts the status quo without conforming to earthly forms of power. We are reminded that allegiance to Jesus calls for radical commitment to truth over comfort or social standing. To be in Jesus' kingdom is to be captivated by truth, which stands in stark contrast to worldly agendas. I guess what I would say to you two days before an extremely stressful day in our nation is this. Tuesday matters, but it doesn't matter as much as you think it matters. As an American, please vote. You need to vote. You should vote. But Tuesday does not matter as much as you think it matters because we serve a kingdom of heaven, not an earthly kingdom. And Jesus' kingdom transcends earthly political structures. And sometimes we like to retreat from culture. And please, what I am not telling you, Christian, is to not be involved with politics. I'm telling you to run into politics, to run into the public school system, to run into every single social engagement that we have. Why? Why do I say all of this? Because somehow, somewhere throughout Christian history, we have been told that we are on the losing side of the battle. And I believe if you're sitting here under my voice today, that you believe the Bible is true. Do you believe the Bible is true? All right, so if you believe the Bible is true, then let me give you a quick Bible history lesson. One third of the angels are with the enemy, correct? All right, how many does that leave us? Two thirds, okay. Also, the enemy was only an angel. That makes his equal Michael the archangel, not Jesus. Not Jesus. So we are playing a game to where we have two thirds of, of the heavenly hosts on our side. We have the creator of the game on our side. We have the very spirit that indwells inside of us is the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead living inside of us. And somehow, some way, we've accepted this idea to where we just hide and hope culture doesn't get to us. We're playing a game. Actually, the Bible describes it as a war. And we win. Like, by a lot. It's not close. It's not this battle. Oh, I hope I win. I grew up in Christendom thinking like, man, I'm just hoping I can take an inch forward. No. You are flying forward on the winning side. Please hear me, family. Tuesday matters. It does. It just doesn't matter as much as you think it matters. Because you worship the King of Kings. The Lord of Lords. The Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. Hear my voice. I'm not telling you to run away. I'm telling you the opposite. To run towards it. Because if Jesus is true, which he is, and his mission was to bear witness to truth, then shouldn't we, as other Christians, as Christians is then defined as little Christs, carry that same mission? We should be bearers of truth. In every aspect of society, we are called to engage our culture. And Pilate asks the question. It's fascinating. He goes, what is truth? (laughs) It's a question we've been asking all throughout society. We think that relativism has just hit us recently. This is not an old concept, or this is not a new concept. This is an old concept. Pilate said to him, what is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. I can't, I can't find anything. 
Pilate's inability to recognize the truth before him shows the fut- uh, futility of earthly wisdom without divine intervention. Pilate represents a world that relativizes truth, especially in the face of uncomfortable realities. Today's culture mirrors Pilate's skepticism, questioning the existence of absolute truth. Yet as followers of Jesus, we are to ground ourselves in the truth that Jesus embodies. Why? Because truth is not merely a concept, but a person, Jesus himself. The understanding of this invites us into a relational rather than a mere philosophical pursuit of truth. Jesus is the truth that we live from. Jesus is the truth that we stand in. Jesus is the truth that we allow ourselves to be guided in, to be moved in. And Pilate's rhetorical question, what is truth, reveals his cynicism. This is not a search for understanding, but a dismissal of truth's relevance. And so many times, if we're not careful, we, like Pilate, are standing before truth and skepticism. And fearfully, we do not embrace the truth. I guess how I would phrase it to our family, to our church in today's age would be this. What is the truth that God is laying in front of you that is too hard for you, for me, for us to embrace? So many of us have received the salvific grace of Jesus Christ He is now our Lord and Savior. And now as Jesus tries to bring us to new levels of truth, we sit At the same stand as Pilate does, choosing between the truth of Jesus and the skepticism, the relativism, the falsehoods that the world has to offer. And we wonder why our lives are riddled with anxiety, stress, depression, loss of self-control, no ability to win, no joy, depleted of happiness. Man, a life built on truth, a life built on the person of Jesus Christ begins to reveal what? Boldness, strength, peace, generosity. Family, I don't know what it is for you, but I know what it has been for me. And there's been times in my life where I felt like Pilate standing at the stand and Jesus is sitting there and saying, you know what I'm about, Pilate. Don't you know what I'm about? And he goes, yeah, but... Look, man, like all of the whole entire world is like bringing all these accusations against you. And I just kind of want to deal with it. Like, it's just much easier for me to go down this road. Right. Man, maybe you like me have battled with that before. And it's way easier to go down the road of culture than it is to go down the road of Jesus. Why? Because we're going to be ostracized at work and it's going to make us feel a little weird. And maybe our kids don't get invited to those birthday parties. Then we're going to have to explain to them why Jesus is number one and and all of these things. And it's just it's all of these things swirling. And and you feel like you're sitting there and you're on the stand. You're like Pilate. And you feel like for some reason, I really want to just I want to, I don't see anything wrong with this guy. I I can't find anything wrong with this guy. I I know this is true, but oh man, you know what? What is truth? And you just walk down this lane. Have you like me been there before where you've just walked down the lane? I would challenge you family. I challenge you Christian to ask, what is the truth that God is laying in front of you that is too hard for you to embrace? And then lastly, lastly, The passage ends like this. It's a fascinating story. I cannot wait to continue it with you next week. Jesus and Barabbas. So, Pilate, sitting there, looks at Jesus, looks at the Jewish people and says, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So, do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? (laughs) They cried out, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. We see the story of Jesus going to the cross and everything seems to kind of be hand in hand. And then there's this one character that seems to interrupt the narrative. His name's Barabbas. We don't even know much about him except that he's a murderer, a leader of an insurrection, a rebel, and why he's even mentioned, sometimes I'm not so sure. It's like, what? Let's, 
This is about Jesus going to the cross. So in this moment, Pilate thinks, I hold the destinies of these two men in my hand. I know the Jews have a tradition that on a holy day, I will release one of the prisoners on death row. Pilate stands on this audacious stage who now presents Jesus, son of the living God, versus Barabbas, the thug and rebel. He says, all right, who do you want? This is blasphemy. This is, this is gone too far. There's no comparison. This is a rightful prisoner, a man who should be on death row. He's a rebel against Rome. He leads a rebellion. He murders people. He's a bad man. He's a thug and he's a crook. He deserves the chains and he deserves the crucifixion. Jesus, what has he done but heal, restore, deliver, set free, open blind eyes, open deaf ears, heal the lame and the leper? What, what has Jesus done? Who do you want? We want Barabbas. Yeah, give us Barabbas. People say, give us Barabbas. The Roman soldiers come up and they put the key in and they unlock Barabbas from his chains and shackles. And he walks down the platform, welcomed by all of his thug friends. Yeah, the people love me. Yeah, that's right. I don't even know who this Jesus guy is, but all I know is my people love me. There seems to be no conscience in Barabbas. There's no record of him turning to Jesus and saying, I owe you everything now, for you have set me free. No, I don't see any of that in Barabbas. God knew that. Jesus stood there, silent for he knew the will of the Father. He said, it's fine, Father. Let him have Barabbas. For Jesus knew that the Father would have to treat Jesus like Barabbas so he could treat Barabbas like Jesus. Barabbas thought it was the people that set him free. No, 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 no. It was the love of the Heavenly Father. I deserve it. 
Jesus seems to look at me and say, no, son, let me have it. Let me have your sin. Let me have your pain. No, God, I did it to myself. I deserve it. My marriage won't make it. This is what I deserve. I deserve divorce. I deserve poverty. I deserve sickness. I deserve it all. No. God, I say, I'm so ashamed. Give me your shame. But God, what if I do it again? I'll still be here. Oh, God, I don't want to hurt you. I love you. I, I don't want to do this anymore. Give me your sins, son. This is all we got. It's all I got. It's all you got. We can play games. We can play church games. We can pretend like some people are better than others, and that's why they're blessed. Or we can all come to the honest conclusion that it's God. And it's God alone. The greatest challenge is not your discipline, your devotion, your focus. Your greatest challenge is believing the gospel. Could it be that there's a God with a love so scandalous, so wide, so deep, so vast, so high, so expansive, so welcoming, so inclusive? Let me have your sin, son. Okay. And I give him my sin. And I stand in this empty space of forgiveness and acceptance while Jesus walks off to the cross that I deserve. I see him, I see him walking to the post to be whipped. As I stand a free man, all the attention is turned now. And I feel the love of God saying, Go, son, live your life. I'll pay the price. Where did we get off thinking that we were going to set ourselves free? It's still Jesus. It'll always be Jesus. It'll never stop being the power of Jesus. If his blood is sufficient for your salvation, his blood is sufficient to sustain you through every challenge and every sin and every temptation. Jesus is enough. In choosing Barabbas, humanity, me, you, all of us, reveal our proclivity to self-destruction in its rebellion against God. As believers, we're called to the allegiance of Jesus, grounded in the truth of Christ's kingdom. Let us choose truth over compromise, allegiance to Jesus over social acceptance, allegiance to Jesus and the kingdom of God over the kingdoms of this world. But perhaps family, you find yourself here today never making that initial decision for Jesus. The same choice offered to the crowd that day is the same choice that's before you to receive the Lord Jesus or to continue following your own path. Jesus' kingdom is one of peace, truth, love, eternal life. That life purchased through his sacrifice on the cross. And no matter who you are, no matter where you've been, the invitation is open to you today. So family, stand with me, if you will. For those ready to choose Jesus this morning that never have, I invite you to respond by praying this prayer with me as we pray this prayer as a church together. Church, repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I recognize that I need you. 
I confess my sins and ask for your forgiveness. I believe that you died for me and rose again to give me new life. I invite you into my heart as my savior and as my king. Help me to follow you and live in your truth from this day forward. Holy Spirit, thank you. Thank you for everything that you've done today. Thank you for what you're even doing in this moment right now. God, the greatest thing that we can do is just get out of your way. So please, please in this moment, God, I know there's somebody here today that desires to choose you, but is feeling so gripped by the world. I pray that you break them free of that. For those of you who received Jesus, let's just make this a moment between me and you. Maybe you prayed that prayer for the first time. Maybe you prayed that prayer for the hundredth, thousandth time, and today was the day that it just clicked. I had a lady come up to me after service, say to me, Pastor Blake, I prayed a prayer like that so many times in my life. For 30 years, I've been praying prayers like that. But it didn't really, I didn't really feel anything until today. Maybe that's you. If that was you this morning, if that's you right now, will you just look up at me? Just make a moment between me and you. There's different ways that I want you to let me know because we don't believe in followership alone. We believe in followership and community. I mean, it's in our name. We want to help you embrace this new community and family that you found here today and be able to follow the kingdom of God. Thank you, Jesus, for the numerous faces that have looked at me during this time. We receive them into the kingdom and in our community. We know that you are celebrating with them and we rejoice with you. We thank you for your love and the grace that you've extended to us. Lord, for my fellow Christians in the room, those who have made that declaration long ago, but still find themselves struggling periodically. Maybe this is a season of struggle for us or them. <sighs> to where they feel like they're pilot and they, they, they're battling choosing you over Barabbas. Lord, break those chains, set them free. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence. It's in his name.